21st century Earth smells like human. Wow, a real life space chimp. Oh, yes, yes, marvel at the space chimp. I'm not here for your amusement, you know. I gotta get a selfie with you. What is it with you humans and your social media? This must be what you call a rat race. Well, let me tell you something. I know rats, and they would never create this sort of society. It's like you humans are in a never-ending hurry to... Well, I don't know quite why you're always in a hurry. Are you here to take over? Take over? Take over? Why would I want to take over this mess? This would be a much better place if everyone just watched the Cosmic Companion, you know? What are your future plans? Is that my future plans? I'll tell you about my future plans, mate. If I ever get back home to my own time, I'm going to become a sci-fi filmmaker. I'll create a film called Planet of the Humans. Action! Join me as we go. Exploring exploration. Talking with John Waterman from National Geographic. Oh yes, let's explore. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this week we explore exploration, exploring the human need to explore. Later in the show, we're going to be talking with John Waterman, creator of Atlas of Wild America from National Geographic. Now, since the dawn of time, humans have been driven by our primal urge, the need to explore. This innate curiosity has shaped our history propelling us from the confines of caves to the vast expanse of our planet and beyond. Now let's take a detour down memory lane. Somewhere between 75,000 and 50,000 years ago, a group of mobile Homo sapiens decided to take humankind's first road trip out of Africa, even without roads. Now talk about wanderlust. This migration wasn't just a change of scenery. It resulted in a monumental shift for our species, shaping human evolution. And who could forget the ancient Greeks and the Phoenicians? They were among the original seafaring explorers navigating the Mediterranean long before GPS and Google Maps. Wait, what? Hmm? Oh, uh, I'm getting a notification that we have a surprise guest on the show this week. Yes? Is this real? Are, are you sure, Max? Wow, okay. Everyone, in a special chronophone interview from 330 BCE, please welcome famed navigator, astronomer, and all-around curious fellow, Pythias. Catrate. Name's Pythias. I'm just your average merchant from Basilla. Mm, where? What? Oh, oh, that's somewhere in what you'd call the Provence region of southern France. So, anyway, I've always had this thing for stories, you know what I mean? And really, the wilder the better. Now, more than 23 centuries before your time, I heard tales of mythical lands, strange creatures, and seas that stretch beyond the horizon. Now, most folks dismiss these as sailors' yarns. No, 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 that's a thing. You'd be surprised how many sailors enjoy macrame. But me, hearing these stories, I thought, why not go check out these legends for myself? So, what did I do? I packed my bags and I set sail. Now, let me tell you, sailing the Mediterranean is a piece of honey cake. But the Atlantic? Oh no, that's a whole different kettle of fish. No, I mean, literally, the fish are different. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, uh, fish. Fish. Anyway, there I was, circumnavigating the land that you now call Britain, or as it went by in its impetuous youth, Britannia. 
Now, I always had a knack for astronomy, and I even figured out that the North Star isn't exactly north. Also, I realized that the moon plays a role in tides. Good to know when you're spending months or years at sea. But, no, no, I wasn't on the boat all the time. I also got to walk around parts of Britannia, including the legendary tin mines of Cornwall. The people call, they are, call themselves the Britain Celtics. <laughs> I didn't even know they played basketball. But up north, the real highlight was the midnight sun. Imagine this. It's the middle of the night, but the sun is still shining brightly. Great for getting more science done, if not for sleeping outdoors. So, there you have it. I'm just a regular guy on an extraordinary journey. Not only did I prove the legends of Northern Europe true, but I also wound up with a good story or two to tell. While you're exploring, tell the Pythias sent you. By the way, any idea where I can hitch a ride on a rocket? Maritime voyages of ancient Greeks and Phoenicians not only expanded their trade routes, but also led to advancements in astronomy, geography, and navigation. Talk about making waves! Then there was Marco Polo, the original globetrotter. Wait, are we talking basketball again? His travels to Asia were like the ultimate vacation slideshow, Except instead of awkward family photos, he brought back tales of exotic lands and cultures that blew everyone's medieval minds. Dude, I'm serious here. I literally hung out with Kublai Khan in Xanadu. There's no way you can top that. And let's not forget about those brave souls who dared to explore the icy wilderness of Antarctica and in the towering heights of Mount Everest. These explorers faced harsh conditions and extreme dangers, but their spirit of adventure and discovery pushed them forward. Their adventures expanded our understanding of these remote places while testing the limits of human endurance. Fortunately for us all, not all exploration is that strenuous or hazardous. Ah! Next up on the Cosmic Companion, we welcome John Waterman from National Geographic to the show. We'll be discussing the human drive to explore and his new Atlas of Wild America. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by John Waterman. He is the author of more than 15 books about nature and the environment. Uh, he was a wilderness guide and a National Park Service ranger. His new book, Atlas of Wild America, is just out from Nat Geo Books, and it's absolutely incredible. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks. Pleasure to be with you. Excellent. So this episode uh, talks about exploration, why we explore the drive for uh, human, the human need for exploration. But how do you see it? Why, do, why, why does the human mind need to explore? Well, in the context of wilderness, I think that wilderness is a wonderful opportunity because it allows us to connect this early and in a way that we don't often connect in the rest of our lives and our busy lives, presumably yours as well as mine. We have 
family and career hmm. connections. And we live in a very connected information age. And when we get out into wilderness, we have the chance to disconnect from all of that and connect in a completely different way and allow our minds to tune into things uh, not only spiritually, but to, to use our senses in a way that we seldom get to do otherwise, uh, to develop even an intuition or a sixth sense. Hmm. Uh, so I think that wilderness is a valuable commodity to the, the human spirit uh, because it, it allows us that time to reconnect. After all, this is what the Native Americans did for many millennia before the colonial days and, and they're being removed from the land. Uh, and we've created this construct of wilderness. It's, in some ways it's artificial, but in many ways it's uh, a very pure concept. Uh, the idea of getting back to the land and reconnecting spiritually with the land. Hmm, that's wonderful. And you have said, I'm going to pardon me if I don't quote you exactly here, um, but you've said to the, something to the effect that we must be fully present in the outdoors in order to witness beauty. Can you expand on that a little bit? Well, uh, on its most simple level, you can. I'm sure that you can go for a hike in your nearest park or or public land and, and uh, run into people that are, for instance, playing music on their, on their iPhone as you walk up the trail uh, and sharing their music with you on the trail. Um, but you can't, you have to be present. You can't be uh, playing music or uh, working uh, with the outside world, you have to be there listening and watching and feeling the place to understand its value, to reconnect. Hmm, it's lovely. Um, and what, what is, how did you become involved in nature and studying about and learning about the wilderness? Well, I grew up in, in the Boston area, hmm. uh, in the suburbs and in the city, uh, surrounded by people and traffic. And uh, my first trip into the mountains of New Hampshire, which does have legislated wilderness areas, I was able to uh, connect in a way that I, I was not able to connect at home. And it planted a seed. And I had to go several more times before I really understood what the value of wilderness was. And by the time I turned 17, I knew that it would be a lifelong pursuit for me. Uh, and so now I, I've spent the last 50 years exploring wilderness around the world, principally in North America, often in the far north of Alaska or, or Canada, uh, as a career. And uh, more importantly, for many years, simply as a passion. I found ways to spend time in the wilderness uh, that I couldn't. Uh, I, for instance, I got work as a guide or a national park ranger so that I could spend more time in these places that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to afford to go to. And I wanted to share them. So it, this quite naturally dovetailed into writing and photography, which uh, gave me the incentive to, to continue spending time and allowed me to, to continue this lifelong journey. Wow. And um, as you mentioned, you're not only, as you alluded to, you're not only a, a writer, but you are also an accomplished photographer. Uh, what, what, in your opinion, makes for a great wilderness photograph? Well, uh, sometimes it, well, great photographs can be an accident, um, but the... I think that the first thing is that you just, you have to be there. You have to spend time. If you don't spend time uh, to see the dawns and the sunsets, uh, to be present when the moose are feeding in the pond or uh, to, to catch that crystalline day or to catch the storm, uh, you can't 
capture it. Um, I think there are many components to a good photograph. I think that, um, that, that if a photograph grabs you, it's a great photograph, but it can be anything. It can be a, a person expressing a sense of wonder, or it could be a scene of, I, I like to think of the opening of one of the chapters of uh, 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 Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Uh, I went there repeatedly and then chartered a pilot and overflew Grand Staircase. Uh, and uh, overflew this particularly breathtaking area of rock spires, sandstone rock spires. Uh, and they're so alien looking and otherworldly and it was early sunset light. Um, I think that that for me uh, encapsulates a great photo uh, because of the other nature, uh, otherworldly quality of the, of the landscape. All right, so uh, we are recording this, um, at least on my side, in the Sonoran Desert. And um, so he, we here in the, in the desert absolutely love our desert life, uh, from saguaros to javelinas. But you've had an encounter with one of the rarest of the animals, the Sonoran pronghorn. Can you tell us a little bit about that adventure? Well, it's I, I've only seen fleeting glimpses of them. Um, and it's known as the desert ghost. And it's a great success story because the Sonoran pronghorn desert ghost was an endangered species. And it's soon to be taken off the endangered species list because we've created these wildlife refuges in these areas, which the the, the animal can uh, have plenty of room to, to roam. And it's just an example of one of the many uh, species of wildlife found throughout the continent that need wilderness. So wilderness is not only a precious commodity for us, for human spirit and for the, the potential for connection, but of course the, uh, if we're to preserve wildlife, we need to, to, to preserve wilderness. Hmm. And uh, what is your most important tip for people going out exploring, especially if they may not be a, an accomplished explorer? Well, I think that preparation is everything. And I think that to uh, study an area read up about it, learn from others' experiences, and to go properly equipped, not only with the right clothing, but the right food. And most importantly, to know your route, to have the maps, mm -hmm. uh, rather than heading into one of these places spontaneously. And with that proper preparation, and a fair amount of what I call self-sufficiency, the, the, i.e. the notion of that you are going to go in and take care of yourself and not rely upon anyone else, that, uh, that you will have a good wilderness experience. Mm. So what were, I'm wondering what were some of your favorite experiences while you're going out, either exploring to research this book or beforehand? Well, there were many. Um, I think of, for instance, an encounter uh, that I had with wolves a long time ago uh, in the Arctic as being one of the seminal experiences to me that really got me interested not only and in, kept me interested in wilderness, but got me interested in the Arctic wilderness. And coming upon a wolf den and these five pups that had never seen human beings before. Uh, and the mother immediately ran away and we stood, I was with another park ranger and watched these pups as they woke up one by one and looked at us, kind of turned their heads, wondering what we were and then uh, ran off only because their mother was howling in the distance, not because they were afraid of us. And swam across the river one by one, we got back in our kayak and the last wolf, the runts of the litter, got stuck in the silt on the far side of the river and we were perplexed about whether we should get out and 
pull the wolf out. But before we could do anything, the two of his siblings came running down off the bluff and grabbed this runt by the scruff of the neck and pulled it out of the mud. <laughs> uh, and then the, the six of them, the mother included, sat there. The mother, so regal, big, beautiful blonde girl, sat there, not even deigning to look at us and waited for us to float by so they could swim back across the river and go back to their den. That that is so amazing. It's such an incredible experience. And um, so I'm wondering what you, what in your opinion, I mean, some of the wilderness areas uh, around North America get a lot of press, get a lot of attention, a lot of tourists. But what do you think are some of the most wonderful underappreciated spots that people may not have heard of? Well, one of them uh, that I just where I had that wolf encounter is the No Attack National Preserve in Arctic Alaska, entirely within the Arctic. Um, it has the largest section of legislated wilderness anywhere in North America, 13 million acres, and the largest protected river shed as well, the No Attack River. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an area where you can see uh, tens of thousands of caribou in the largest caribou herd in uh, the country, the uh, Western Arctic herd, mm -hmm. grizzly bears, wolverines, uh, wolves, of course, uh, and all kinds of bird life. But the the, the landscape itself is just uh, so awe-inspiring. It's hard to get a grasp when you first arrive there what you're looking at because there are no trees in the northern section of the preserve. It's You're in the tun on the tundra north of tree line. And uh, so it takes a long time to actually gain perspective because there are no visual cues. A distant, uh, you might see a distant grizzly bear and think you're looking at a nearby ground squirrel. There are no buildings, no roads, no trees. Uh, and it's a vast place. The valleys are much wider, huge glaciated valleys. So, um, that's just part of the wonder of the place that it is so vast. Uh, and when the wildlife is there, it's also uh, enormous as well, the, the quantity of animals. Mm. You do not want to mistake a grizzly bear for a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going out to feed the squirrel. Don't do it. <laughs> and finally, um, what do you see as the ways that, ex what can exploration teach us uh, about ourselves? Well, I'm, I'm sure that's different from, for everyone, but for me, uh, and particularly as a younger man, um, it taught me the value of self-reliance and um, fitness and health, because you can't go on a wilderness expedition without being prepared physically. Um, and just the ability to do things that you didn't think were possible, that, that, that you weren't possible of accomplishing, whether running a river or, or climbing a mountain. Um, but even more importantly, uh, I've learned the more time I've spent in the wilderness and as I've aged, just the opportunity to connect viscerally, spiritually, intuitively with these places, uh, to, to learn about ourselves that we are really one with nature. We are not separate from it. And that's why we need wilderness. That is a wonderful thought. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, John. It was a pleasure talking with you. The pleasure was mine. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and that was John Waterman, former wilderness guy, National Park Service ranger. Check out his new book, Atlas of Wild America, just out from National Geographic. Now, fast forward to the 20th century, and our thirst for exploration led us to the final frontier, space. The Apollo missions were like an interplanetary camping trip with fewer s'mores and more moon dust. 
When Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon in 1969, it was a giant leap, not just for mankind, but for our collective spirit of discovery. As we look to the future in the 21st century, the spirit of exploration continues to thrive. With advancements in technology, we're not just exploring physical spaces, but also virtual ones. The rise of virtual and augmented reality technologies together with artificial intelligence has opened up new frontiers for exploration, allowing us to experience places and ideas in ways previously unimaginable. As we stand on the precipice of a new era in space exploration with missions to Mars and beyond on the horizon, we are reminded that exploration is not just about reaching new frontiers, but also about pushing our limits and striving for a better understanding of our place in the universe. As we explore the depths of our oceans, the vastness of space, and virtual worlds, we carry with us this indomitable spirit of curiosity. Our future may lie in the words of J.R.R. Tolkien, who said, not all those who wander are lost. Perhaps not, but we actually are lost. There's danger in the east. Do you know the way back west? So go ahead, pack your bags. Don't forget your towel. And let's set off on our next adventure, becoming a better, wiser species than we were before we took our first steps away from the familiar. Because at its core, that's what exploration is all about. Uh, the Cosmic Companion is starting the first half of our winter break, taking three weeks off. After all these dumb jokes and crazy costumes this year, we needed it. Uh, join us as we come back on the 2nd of December, getting the inside story on planets. Talking with physicist Sabina Stanley from Johns Hopkins University. We'll be discussing her new book, What's Hidden Inside Planets. Make sure to join us then. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please download, follow, share, send large sums of money to us, like, and comment on our show. Have a great Thanksgiving, and we're going to see you all back here on the 2nd of December. Bring a plus one. Clear skies. <laughs>